Today, we have the pleasure of speaking with Josh Felser, the co-founder and managing director of Climactic VC. Climactic VC is a venture capital firm that focuses on investing in climate-focused companies, with over 20 years of experience in the tech industry, Josh is a seasoned investor and entrepreneur who is passionate about using technology to address climate change. Josh, <laughs> welcome to Speak Bold. Thank you. Excited to be here. It's nice to have you here. You came here all the way from Mill Valley, I did. downtown San Francisco. How was the drive? It's weird coming to downtown, right? Fidei is like this strange like version of itself, and so I don't come down here very often. So. I'm you, you're the you're the reason I'm here, and it's uh, you know I'm, I'm it's weird to see downtown the way it is today. Yeah, actually, it's kind of been a thing that people talk about, right? That San Francisco downtown is kind of the ghost town version of itself. Yeah. And you've been downtown for many years. I'm trying to say I'm older. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I started my whole tech career working on Bryant and Third at Organic Online back in God, the late 90s. So I got to see, you know, it develop. Oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, it was the whole internet thing was just starting and no one knew what was going and we were just talking about digitizing everything and, and, um, and I got to be part of that as a founder and I was the first one to really put music online and turn it into streams of radio that you can listen to um, from anywhere. What was your expectation moving to San Francisco versus what actually San Francisco felt like? It was better than what I thought it was going to be like. It was, you know, back in like the 90s and the early 2000s, it was like a, a dream being here. I mean, it was so much happening. We were all having an impact and pioneering. Everything was new, you know, like the first website of everything. You know, it was all happening then, and so it was exciting to be part of that. And music was happening, and like food was happening, and then Burning Man happened, and kind of all that soup of things was really why I moved here. I mean, I moved here really because San Francisco is a, is the city of misfits, and the weird, and the unusual, and that's what drew me here. And you can still find it today. It's a little harder than it was back then. Interesting. Did you? feel like you were a misfit wanting to find a community or did you come here and feel like I think I can be a misfit in this community? The second. I wanted to be a misfit and I was like it was hard when you're you know on the path of like going to college and grad school and like doing the right thing and then at some point I'm like I don't want to do the right thing every time all the time I want to be more like tap into that weird part of me that that you know cannot always wear the same thing that you know, can wear things that are maybe unexpected and, yeah. and to act in unexpected ways and to think unexpected things. And I think that's part of being a misfit is that you don't have to conform. When you got here, tell me a little bit about your career. Tell me about your path. I got the bug to move out here in 97. Officially, I moved. And um, I could say everything that I did led up to this, but it, some of it did, some of it didn't. You know, my uh, my background in product and business development, those two those two parts of my life were developed before I got here and served me well when I got to San Francisco. How was it moving to a new place and then getting through the first bubble burst? Well, I mean, I have had extraordinary luck it really was luck, not like some kind of foresight. I started my company in my first company, Spinner in 06, 07, and, um, and we sold it right before the crash. I started my second company in like 04, and we sold it right before the second crash. So I am, and I can't say I was like really, I didn't have a crystal, I didn't have a crystal ball I could look at. I just was like, oh, it seems like we should probably sell this company and and so that's what we did so I got lucky and missed it and so when the crash happened I was you know it was hard seeing my friends so impacted by it but I personally wasn't um, and you know these things like we got in over our skis and the crash was tough but it that brought us back to earth and then everybody started building again and yeah you know then the next crash got a little over our skis and then you know we here's where we are today with like SVB crashing and and um, because SVB got over its skis. Yeah, yeah. We need the adjustments, even though it's it, it is very painful. Being it's painful. Yeah, it is painful, and to see 
like other entrepreneurs impacted by it and you know it's painful to see it got it but it seems to be the way of life what well, let's talk a little bit about what got you into investing talk about freestyle capital there's nothing more exciting than being a founder and there's also nothing more stressful than being a founder like I, there's a story there's a, a founder that i'm a female founder i'm friends with who is pitching her company to um a venture capital fund and and during that pitch the partner that my friend was pitching to she basically shared that her job was the hardest job on the planet that she had to look at all these companies and figure out which ones to invest in and manage them and she's trying to convince this founder that her job is harder as a vc and i'm like that person's never been a founder because like you know being a vc is the easiest job on the planet compared to being a founder and so for me it was the stress it was like a life balance stress reducing issue because i you know i'm being a founder took a lot out of me the second time. I, we had to pivot in the middle of it and, and I got sleep apnea, you know, while I was a founder from the stress. Yeah. Um, I don't have it now because I don't have the same stress in my life. And so I think that job was as much to like stay as close as I can to tech and working with founders, but not be one myself. And so being an early stage investor, was like the next best thing. What were you most proud of from Freestyle? I was the public like face of freestyle. I think Dave would say that too, my co-founder. And I think building that, when we started freestyle, we set out to build a brand. Like everyone said, what do you mean to build a brand and venture? It doesn't happen. And we, it was in our deck in the very beginning that we presented to investors and they're like, really? We don't think like, we're not investing you for that, but if you do it, great. And so we, um, we did it. We built freestyle, became a brand that was known for like we were founders investing in founders and and we were operators and, and that's what we were known for. And people would reach out to us and say, you're the, we only want an operator to invest in us and you are both founders and operators. And so, and so we built that brand and we invested in some great companies, um, Airtable and Patreon and Intercom and BetterUp and um, Superside, which is a relatively new one. Superside is Norwegian, uh, which is cool. Yeah, I'm still on the board and they're doing really well. And so... I think it's it's the the brand and the companies we invest in and the founders we invest in, like they all support each other. And so the brand is, I look at that brand and say, I'm really proud that I created that brand. What made you move to the next venture, Climactic? Yeah, so it's a complicated uh, process. I've been working with Dave through a lot of successes for, I guess, 20 years. And so we've had a great history together and we've been doing the same thing at Freestyle, kind of the same thing. Once we got to like fun two or three, like probably fun three, our process didn't change. We kind of were doing the same thing, which is still great to be doing the same thing after a period of years, but it was the same thing. And then when COVID hit, February of 20, um, I pitched the governor. That's a long, another story, but I pitched the governor on, on the idea of creating a task force that would really source the private sector to solve many of the changes from COVID. And I sent him a company that I wasn't involved with, but I had met, and they were the best at detecting infectious disease hotspots anywhere in the world and report on them. And so we were, COVID was starting. And so Governor Newsom was trying to figure out where the next hotspot would be. And so I connected to this company and Within a week, they did a deal, and the company predicted the next hotspot would be the Iranian population in LA. And they were right. And so the city was able to prepare for that and serve that, you know, those needs there. And and then from that, like, he was like, we got to do this more. And so we started this task force. I did it with Bill Trenchard, who's a VC at first round. And, and for five months, we both kind of took time off for our jobs, and we just focused on it. It was pretty eye-opening. Um, exciting and frustrating like it's hard to get stuff out at the state even though we had this great you know backing from the governor um we were successful in a lot of areas and frustrated in some areas but overall it was a great experience and that gave me religion around like the private sector really being necessary to solve the biggest problems of our day which is really climate um and maybe the biggest and so at the time like freestyle was doing its fifth fund and i had this desire to go work on the planet and the timing worked out and um, and it made sense to jump. 
then to uh, to Climactic. And so I, I think I I was still I'm still a board partner in Freestyle, but I think I'm almost done because all of my companies have raised successful next rounds, and that was kind of the barometer. I would stay with them until they raised their next rounds, and so I think that every single one of them has now done that in my um, last in the last fund I was involved in. So I'm on the cusp of dropping off <laughs> fully a freestyle, which, and then I can, you know, really be focused 100% on Climactic. Can you tell me about any of your portfolio companies that you're particularly excited about and why? I mean, we have, um, so we're in this unusual situation. We have investments before the fund, which have been contributed to the fund. Um, there are 11 of those. And then there are, um, we have three new investments that are fund investments. And so uh, only one of the three fund investments is public. And so I can't talk about the other two. Okay. Um, but I can talk about some of the angel investments. And so um, I'll talk about one of, there's one that I'm especially excited about because it, it really does relate to how software can change the world. And in the climate space, there are lots, there's lots of debate about whether like you have to invest in really complex hardware to change the world or whether your software can do it or some combination of both. And so we, um, we're more of a software focused fund where we actually, there's low tech hardware we invest in, but it's commoditized hardware. It's the software that makes that hardware smart. Um, and so one of the companies we invest in is called WeaveGrid. And what WeaveGrid does is it sits in between your car and the utility and the automaker, and they basically optimize for when your car should be charged. And then they they sell this demand forecasting software to the utilities. The utility can look at all the cars that are connected to the network and forecast their energy needs out into the future. And so WeaveGrid wants to take every EV that's being charged and optimize when they're charged across the network, in the utilities network. Um, and that's interesting and needed because if every car is being charged at the same time, they'll take down the grid. Our electrical grid is very um, old and not very flexible and not designed for that. It's designed for, you know, coal, you know, coal plants and natural gas plants firing up, you know, and being used as needed. Not for this kind of like everybody charging their something big at the same time. Right. Uh, and so WeaveGrid actually spreads it out in a way that works. But what they're really doing down the road is they're basically, this is why I love what they're doing. They're going to turn every electric vehicle into a, store, a battery that stores energy for the utility, right? So imagine if you have all, you have wind and solar, you know, generating power, but you know, at night there's no solar obviously and, and wind can be spotty, but if you can store that energy, you can use it as you need it. And so every EV has a battery. That battery is massive, biggest battery you'll ever have in your home. And imagine if that could be used all across the network to store energy. And I, as the EV owner, would be willing to do it if you charge my car for free. So that's an example of software turning hardware into something really, really useful. So that's, I'm really excited about WePrint. Excited for yeah. it amazing do, do you does the climate focus change your investment decisions or is it kind of the same regardless of what business it would be yeah so yes and no so the due diligence we do on a company to assess their financial performance is the same it's the same like front free stock on actives matter we have to do an additional additional round of due diligence on impact and that, of course, is very different because we only invest in companies that both have like financial potential and impact potential. And so that impact analysis is, is very different. And it's not that it's like at the seed stage, there's some like there's false precision to try and estimate it down to the 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 ton of carbon removed from the planet. But it's a qualitative. We have to see the path to significant impact on on the planet, whether it's you know, water, biodiversity, and especially emissions. And so for every company, we have to assess that. And and we have to really assess the founder's mission yeah. in this area because a lot of times we'll see a pitch and the founder will say, hey, this is the opportunity, but the founder, him or herself, isn't actually 
equally motivated by impact. And so something can change. And instead of trying to find the solution that still involves impact, they're going to switch to something purely financial. And we've seen that happen enough times now. It happened once in our own portfolio that we actually had to, to you know, decide not to invest any more in that company. How do you see the role of technology helping prevent, fight climate change? I mean, they're, they're 90% of the world's GDP is under some company's net zero goal, right? So that's great. So the companies have stood up and said, great, we're gonna be net zero by a date, by whatever the date they've picked. And now 90% of the world's economy is under someone's net zero goal. So if all those net zero goals came true, we would solve climate change. The problem is that if you talk to the Walmarts of the world, the Nestles of the world, they'll tell you that they cannot, they don't have a plan to get to net zero without serious innovation. And that innovation all comes from technology and the startup ecosystem that we're helping to create. So we have to do this. Like there's no, you know, climate change is, when you look at what we have to do to fight it, it's actually simple at some level, like electrify everything and all that energy needs to be clean. If we do that, like we're gonna solve climate change. The problem is like, obviously, how do we electrify everything? How do we um, create more renewable energy? And how do we store that? How do we deliver that when it's needed across, you know, across the planet? But it's not like the concepts aren't, aren't hard to understand. And so to get from where we are now to there is gonna require significant innovation and um, how we, track, measure, report, how we create more efficiency in the supply chain. Like how do we help manufacturers um, understand what their missions are all the way through to, to creating the, the insets in their supply chain. To talk about in a second, the insets in their supply chain. Um, insets are when companies like Nestle, which has like 90% of its impact is in its supply chain, in its suppliers. Right, not anything they directly control, but they can invest in those suppliers, in them doing things more efficiently and, and with less impact. And those insets are really key to moving to net zero. And they're different than offsets, as which a lot of what we hear about when people, when you're buying um, carbon credits to protect a part of the Amazon, which is also very important, that's an offset. When you're helping a farmer move to regenerative ag and you're Nestle, that's an inset because it's part of your supply chain. So we want to see more insets because those insets actually are about reducing, reducing carbon in your own supply chain versus buying your way out um, of your own carbon emissions through natural carbon sequestration like in forests. And, and, and do companies like Nestle want to help do these insets? Yes. Okay, yes. so it is beneficial. Yes. Them. They're, they're not just like, I don't, it's not a part of our company, we're not gonna worry about it. No, they're, they're actually, their net zero goals include their, their supply chain. Like they're, I mean, Apple actually went public, I think recently, and they said that by 2035, they're not going to buy from anyone who isn't also net zero. And 90% of their emissions come from their supply chain. Oh, wow. Yeah, so 90% of Apple's emissions come from their suppliers, the people they buy from, and that counts towards their, their own emissions that they count for themselves. So where's the bottleneck here then? It's a government? So, glad you asked. So one of the biggest bottlenecks is, and I could talk about this for an hour, is the way that, so if you have a, a project like a, could be an acre of forest or a farmer that wants to move to regenerative agriculture, which is better for the planet. Right now, there are two organizations, both nonprofits that are responsible for that verification. And I'm gonna say, they suck. They suck, they charge too much, they take too long, they're not adaptable. We need a new solution, multiple solutions to, we, right now there are like 1,300 nat, natural, pro, nature-based sequestration projects that have been approved. We need 100,000. So the bottleneck 
really is the folks that are doing the verification and the monitoring. They're too slow, too expensive, and they're often wrong. And so we need to create a new way for all of these projects to get approved and verified. And when they're verified, they're verified in the sense that they're um, a third party is able to say, okay, we think this acre of forest is going to pull this amount of carbon out of the atmosphere. And so it's worth X. We need that. And so right now we have all these great projects that could really help the planet and they're just stuck in a queue or they're not, or, or the, the sponsors, like the indigenous folks who might be sponsoring it can't afford to pay the nonprofit that's doing the review. So we need to fix that. That's a huge part of the problem. And is that, do you have any companies or would your company be involved with anything? We definitely want to fund that space. We definitely want to fund that space. So we're excited about that. It's a huge opportunity for the planet and for, you know, for us and for other investors. And we need, you know, we need to have not just our capital, but, but a lot more flowing into those solutions. Yeah. And is it, is it easy for, for like private sector companies to work with, cause you know, everybody wants the same thing here. Like, is it easy to work with government and to work with these big companies like Nestle and Walmart? to yeah. uh, try to get to the same goal? It's not easy. No. Um, but, you know, it, it's not, there's like a path that's, you know, we've seen in tech. So it's like you, Airtable's one of the companies that I was involved with in, in the very beginning. And Airtable started out selling to, you know, SMBs, small and medium sized businesses, and, and to prove that what they were building was desired. And what happened is that enough SMBs that enough employees at big companies started using Airtable and then before you know it it became an enterprise company and I think there's a pattern to that that we need to track and follow in, in, cl in climate change which is it's okay to sell to smaller businesses first prove what you're doing raise some more capital look more credible and then start pitching the bigger companies that's a tried and true path there's nothing wrong with that path and I think we need to make sure we follow that in, in climate change, even though there may be an, like, it may be tempting to go pitch a Nestle on your brand new startup, but it's unlikely Nestle will work with you yeah. until you've proven more. So I think that's it. The planet can't really wait, but I think that the way business works, we have to, we, we it's gotta be hard to sidestep this, this path, this B2B path, which is like smaller to bigger, to bigger, to bigger. In a perfect world, how would you see this solved, this path? Um, we need to bring, we need to bridge, we need to really bridge like climate tech with general techies. Like we need more and more folks, more talent to jump from tech to climate tech. We really do. And and it's starting. Like there, there's an organization that we helped start. Um, one of the five VCs that started it called Climate Draft. They literally draft tech, you know, tech execs to go work in the climate tech. And we need more of that, more folks that know how to scale and know how to sell and market to the enterprise to actually jump from tech to climate tech. And it's happening, so it's exciting to see it. But, and we're trying to be a bridge also because my partner Raj and I, we're, we're both serial founders and general tech investors. And so we're trying to pull in as many of our peers and, and, their, and their employees into climate tech. And so we need to do more of that, a lot more. Do you feel like people are like, exhausted from hearing about the problem like yeah. you're saying right now we need yeah. more people to go into climate tech and people are like yeah we've been needing that for a really long time we're just kind of tired of hearing about it i think we're tired of hearing about polar bears <laughs> you know which is sad because obviously polar bears are impacted but that strategy of like showing a stranded polar bear like we're tired of hearing about that we're tired of hearing about fear yeah i think but <clears throat> we're not tired of hearing about solutions and so i think part of what's exciting about climate tech right now is that there are solutions that are actually having real impact. And I think that that is exciting and pulling people in from tech, but we can't keep like talking about, it. I mean, I, I often like tweet fearful, you know, fear, fearful shit. And I also tweet about solutions. And I think it has to be a balance between the fear and, uh, and being able to do something. And I think now finally we're, we're able to do something in a way that, that has huge impact on the planet. I think that's the draw. And speaking about motivation, yeah. what makes you motivated to work in this field? Because it is not an easy field. No. 
Someone's gonna do like a mental health study of climate tech founders versus general tech founders. I'm really interested in that because both are incredibly stressful. But as you're alluding, like climate tech founders have this added existential stress that they're not, you can argue that they are trying to make the world better, but truly they're trying to make it less bad. I think that's a really different, you know, approach to entrepreneurship is like, I'm trying to make something less bad. Um, and I think that creates a level of stress every day and urgency that is beyond what a typical tech founder has to deal with. Um, there are differences like mental health and, and other areas that where we all, you know, we all feel an emotional um, pull, but like creating the next sales support software versus like, you know, creating the software that's going to help companies understand their impact on the world. You know, they're just very, there's such a, such different experiences. So I think you're, you're right. The, the added existential stress of being a, a climate tech founder is very real. Do you have any moments where you're like, I'm so glad I'm here. This is fantastic that I'm not necessarily you, yeah. but you and your peers that, that we're yeah. doing this job. I can't imagine doing anything else, which is what I said as a founder. And so the first time I've said that since I was a founder in general tech, like, and so I feel the same way. I can't imagine doing anything else. I mean, I have to be like, I had to be part of like the nineties, like digitization, everything. And I've got to be part of the 2020s decarbonization of everything. And there are a lot of similarities between those two things. Like, you know, I could go into that, like in the digitization, everything world, there were separate back in the day in the nineties, there were like chief digital officers and separate digital groups and, and it was very separate from the rest of the work that a company was doing. And, and then it became integrated and like, there's not a separate digital group. It's all part of each product has its own, you know, linear digital flavors. And I think in sustainability right now, we have something similar as a chief sustainability officer and a sustainability group, but then it's going to be totally integrated and eventually. Yeah. And so I see that, that path and the similarities between the two. And so. I couldn't help but be part of it then, and I can't help be part of it now. That's wonderful. Yeah. Thanks. Do you, and this is probably something you, people get asked a lot, what are some actionable items that individuals and businesses can do? I don't believe that, that individuals are really going to have a meaningful impact on the planet. Even if we, well, one, because we're not gonna, like changing behavior is really hard, and I don't think outside of the, maybe the 10% who are really activated that the rest of the, of the world, especially the developing world will change behavior and nor should they like we've, you know, we fucked the planet and now we're going to tell the developing world, oh, you can't have air conditioning, right? Like we're not going to, that doesn't seem fair. So it shouldn't happen. So I don't think consumers are going to be the change, although they will have an impact in with their voices. So you look at why companies are really changing their stripes. One, like that motivated 10% of the population is having an impact. The biggest investors on the planet are having an impact. They're mandating the companies change. Governments having an impact, like the EU especially is having an impact. Um, the company's own employees are asking for change, which is also, so all that super thinks is having a big impact on what companies are doing. I think it's the companies that that will have the impact, not the individuals. So I think that consumers like will go green, but if it's cooler, cheaper, more convenient, like, you know, it's like a Tesla, right? We won't sacrifice for green, you know? And so it's in the Bay area. It's easy to think, well, look around, we're like all recycling and this, that's not representative of the rest of the world. And so as a fund, we're really focused on really investing the technologies that help company is go green, right? Not, um, not individuals for reasons that I, that I said, um, but in the company world, like the first thing companies have to do is understand their footprint, right? That's the first thing. And that is true for big and small. And there, there's a ton of software out there to help you understand your footprint and then understand what you can do about it, how you reduce your footprint. And so there's no, there's no formula like, if you're um, a manufacturing company, that's one footprint. If you're a, a retail 
a retailer, that's another footprint. So I, I don't have prescriptive, everything's prescriptive. I don't have like a generic solution, except to understand where your emissions lie. And, and then it's not hard to do the research to find out what you can do about it. Um, do you feel like there, there's a cultural difference between different places when you talk to companies yeah. whose founders are from, I mean, we're here yeah. in the Bay Area, we're kind of in a bubble. Yep. And then you talk to people from, I, I don't know, the Midwest or maybe yeah. Texas. Is it, how, is it a very different approach to be like, this is your carbon footprint? Yes. Yeah. And in the EU is, I mean, any, like, if you look at the EU, they're, the best work on the planet's happening in the EU, right? Where... And so you can see the change. There's a culture and a vibe of like planetary caring, right? And, and the government's very deeply involved. Here, like when we started our fund, we decided that we wouldn't invest in any company that's dependent on the government in any way. Because like, you know, I mean, I can't imagine if we change um, from the Democrats to the GOP in 24 in the, in the White House, we may find a lot of these, um, a lot of what we're counting on, yeah. you know, uh, spurring kind of development here in climate that could go away. I mean, some of the IRA bill, which, which is this $380 billion um, bill, these two bills, the CHIPS bill and the IRA bill, they're kind of front loaded. And so I think that though that won't be vetoed, I mean, that can't be changed or vetoed or whatever in 24, I think most of it will have been spent which is great. Yeah. But I mean, there are there, like, if I took you through the bills that are being proposed by the GOP right now, you'd be shocked, like rolling back renewable energy credits and, and uh, pushing for, you know, for greater oil and natural gas production. And it's scary now. I mean, the sad thing is yeah. I probably wouldn't be shocked. Right. <laughs> you would be, but other people would be right. Yeah. So. Biden's able to veto it. He's threatening to veto a lot of these things that are coming through and then they probably won't pass. But it's still like, it's amazing some of the shit that's being proposed. So long-winded answer in America, I don't count on, like we don't invest in any company that's counting on, the, counting on their government for anything. The government can provide air cover and that's great and it's helpful. So this these bills are really, we're gonna see like major changes in investment in infrastructure around around EVs, for example, um, and that's exciting. California, on the other hand, you can count on, and California is doing great work. And so we have, you know, and we're the fifth largest economy in the world, so it actually matters. Uh, and so I'm seeing that as exciting, but you know, for every California, there's like a, a Texas and, and another state that is more beholden to the old ways of generating energy, and those states are gonna be doing that for a long time. Yeah. Crypto doesn't really have a very good reputation when it comes yeah. to climate. Yeah, no, so they're, well, crypto and AI is now the bad, bad boy, girl, bad day, is, is maybe AI is a day. <laughs> uh, because a AI is such a power and energy intensive process, right? And, and crypto is similar. So there are solutions that, you know, the beauty of, of kind of like, of, 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 of needs like kind of AI has and crypto is that it can be kind of turned on and off in a way. And so that works really well with renewable energy. So renewable, you could actually power through mining when you have like a lot of wind and, and the bottle of wind and sun, and then that could actually, you know, be the, where the energy comes from. And the same is true for AI, but I'm still getting my arms around kind of AI and climate and, and where that's going and, and uh, but how we can avoid some of the, the challenges that, that really hit crypto and energy usage in the beginning. Absolutely. What kind of legacy do you hope to leave? <laughs> <laughs> Not a small question. Legacy. Um, I don't think about that. You know, I really don't think about that. Um, I really think about the impact I'm having while I'm alive and, um, and, and personally feeling really good about it. So it's like, I actually try not to worry about the leg legacy to me implies what other people think of me. And I actually care a lot less about that. I actually want to feel good about what I'm doing and how I'm moving in the world, living in the world. And it's from everyday things like a kindness that might show a stranger to the impact I'm having with my fund and, and doing my part to help 
heal the planet. But legacy. You know, it's just, it's not a, it's, it's not, it doesn't come up in my everyday life. So I will try and give you an answer. Um, he came, <laughs> he, he saw, he contributed, he was kind, he made a difference. I love that. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. That is a great one, way to end this. Great. Um, I really appreciate you coming here. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. I'm excited I came and got it worked out. And uh, it was great to be your first <laughs> interviewee. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you made it easy for me. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>